Hey everybody, welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad that you have jumped into this message today. You're going to get something wonderful out of today's passage. If you're going through a storm, if you've been through a storm, if you wonder why storms happen, this message is for you today. And I hope you'll stay with it. Listen, as we're going through this gospel, all of the messages stand on their own. So if you haven't heard any of the others in this series, stay with today's. But when I'm done, if you want to hear any other message in this series or any of our other Bible teaching series, they're available through our website. Our website is journeywesterville.org. That's journeywesterville.org. You'll find links there to our Rumble channel, our YouTube page, our Facebook page. All of those contain all of our Bible teachings. I am a Bible teaching pastor in Central Ohio. It's what I've gone to school for. It's what I truly love to do. And, And the passage today was such an encouragement to me over the last week that I'm excited about sharing it with you. And, and it really only is eight verses. I, I went to uh, from, from John 6, 1 through 14 last week. I, I'm kind of keeping 14 uh, through 21 today, so that would make it nine verses. But uh, the story really is, is in 15 through 21, just eight verses. And at the end today, I'm going to give you four really applicable things that go along with it. But, but first, I want to set this up and, and teach through it. Because John, as an old man, is writing this down to compel us with the way Jesus taught him so that we can put ourselves into this passage and and look at how Jesus could teach us the the hardest and most difficult lessons in life. And one of the hardest lessons in life is is sometimes the aftermath of when the Lord does something great. It, it doesn't always quite go the way you think it would. You would think when God does something great, everybody's going to get it. Everybody's going to understand. Everybody's going to be on board. But that's just not always the case, especially here in this passage. And, and John is writing this down to teach the next generation and the next generation and all of us from the sound teaching that Jesus invested in him. And, and as I go through this, uh, there's a lot of sound teaching here. Now, I, I want to start simply by telling you some of the pathways we've been down and going through, John, to get you up to speed. So you don't have to go back and listen to every other message. As I said, they all stand alone. You can go back to them and get the full details. But, but just to brush over, uh, Jesus has been back and forth between Galilee and, and Samaria and Judea, these three regions. They're like three counties in Israel, uh, one on top of the other. Judea is where Jerusalem and the temple is. Uh, Samaria is where the Samaritan woman and and the city of Samaria is. Uh, And and then Galilee is where uh, Jesus and many of the boys are from that area. It's where Jesus' main base of operation was, where he ministered the most. And and up in Galilee is where Cana and Capernaum are. Uh, You're going to hear those often. And, And that's the area where we are in today, kind of up there in that wilderness and and you'll hear in this passage people are getting ready to come down to jerusalem for for yet another jewish festival and they're starting to amass and they're starting to follow jesus by incredible numbers uh, last week when we looked at the feeding of the the five thousand it was five thousand men it's really fifteen thousand people uh, who were out there in the wilderness and there was no place to get any food jesus uh, was up in galilee at a, a wedding that happened over several days, turning water into wine. He was down in Judea, Jerusalem, uh, at the Passover, talking to Nicodemus in the middle of the night. He was in Samaria, in the middle area, uh, with the Samaritan woman in the middle of the day, in the hot sun. He was in back up in Cana in Galilee with a royal official whose son was sick. And he healed his son, who was over in Capernaum, about 20 miles away, at distance. Jesus was back up or back down uh, in in Judea in Jerusalem at the temple and he healed a man who had been in a at the pool of Bethesda unable to walk for 38 years uh, Jesus healed all kinds of different people already and and he reached out and gave the gospel in the middle of the day in the middle of the night it doesn't matter if you're a Jew it doesn't matter if you're a Samaritan it doesn't matter if you're at distance, he could touch you. He could deal with any of these problems because he's sufficient. And, and yet, 
when we go into the passage today, I got to tell you, the disciples don't understand the lesson. Matter of fact, in Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 52, at the end of, of, of this trip that we're going to talk about in, in John 6 today, 14 through 21, uh, this is a, the companion passage in Mark 6, 52. It says, they were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. <laughs> and that's at the end, when they cross the other side. That's at the end of today. They still didn't understand. Mark gets that they don't understand. John gets that they don't understand. And they're writing these things down because they want us to start understanding something. And you say, Chris, what do we need to understand from the passage today? Here's what we need to understand. You can write this down big and plain before I even teach through it. We need to understand how to trust Jesus when we go through struggles. Oh, we don't like struggles. They're foreign to us. When we are struggling, we think maybe God's mad at us. Maybe we've done something wrong. And you're going to see in this passage the disciples needed to understand that struggles show us how much Jesus loves us. They're different than what we'd expect. What does it look like to trust Jesus in your struggles? The disciples had just found out that Jesus could feed 15,000 people in the middle of nowhere just by putting what one little boy had in his sack luncheon into the hands of Jesus. They couldn't figure out how to pay for it. They couldn't find enough food in the crowd. But Jesus could multiply it out with his hands and take care of any needs. They've seen Jesus work in all kinds of places at all kinds of times and always compelling people to trust in him. Yet how hard is it to trust in Jesus, especially when we're struggling? Well, let's look at this passage and ask that question. John 6, 14 through 21. When the people saw the sign Jesus had done, they said, this really is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Then a high wind arose, and the sea began to churn. After they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, and he was coming near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board, and at once the boat was at the shore where they were heading. <laughs> it's an amazing passage. They had seen Jesus do such wonderful things. They had collected 12 baskets of, of, of leftover fish and, and loaves and, and taken them into the boat. The, the, the provision of the Lord, what the Lord had done, was right there literally at their feet, at their fingertips. And yet... They lost hope and became fearful. How quickly does that happen? As I said in Mark, it says they hadn't understood, even though the answer was right there. So many didn't understand. Matter of fact, to back up to verse 14, you would think Jesus did something great, and he comforted a good number of people from the crowd. It says uh, when the people saw the signs, they said this really is the prophet. And you would think great victory. But then we read verse 15, Therefore, when Jesus knew what they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew. Listen, Jesus wanted them to repent uh, from being sinners and turn to him, put their faith in him. But they didn't want that. They wanted to make him a political leader because they thought he would be better at ruling them than the Romans were. They, they were looking for a, a political upgrade instead of repentance and turning to the Lord. What they expected Jesus to do was not what Jesus expected of them. And isn't that often the case? We want Jesus to change everything else except us. Jesus came to be a lamb slain for us. He, he came to make a way for us to come home. He came so that we could be humble because the Lord opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He didn't come to, to be another politician in our world. Lord knows we have enough of them. He didn't come to tax us. He came to give to us. I, I love this, that 
the mob mentality was to install Jesus as a leader, a political leader. It was short-term reality for this world. But Jesus' goal was to die for his people, to be the great king of heaven and the eternal Lord overall. It's a much greater goal. It's a much larger goal. But the crowd missed it. And, and, and I have to ask, how often do we miss what the Lord has done in our lives? And, and we settle for something short-term instead of looking to him for the long-term blessing, the blessing of his kingdom, the blessing of serving him forever, the blessing of calling him Lord. And, and this passage starts off with everybody getting it wrong. And Jesus knows he's got to shut things down because this is going in the wrong direction. And Jesus wants us to understand he's not going to lead something in a wrong way just because it's popular. He's not here for adulation. Jesus came for truth. And so he removes himself. And, and it's interesting, in, in Mark 6, it says in verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. So Jesus is sending the disciples across, but he's not going with them. He dismisses the crowd. He sends his disciples away from that poison. And, and remember, they have the loaves and the fish right there in the boat with them to remind them of all Jesus can do. Now, I, I love this. It, it says that they wanted to make him king. Jesus withdrew. He sent the disciples across. In John 6, 16, it says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started to cross. Now, one of the things when we look at this, we think this is in the evening, 6 or 7, after the dinner, after things that happened. 6 p.m. or so, they get into the boat. Darkness is set in. Now, I, I want you to know that the sea that they're on, the Sea of Galilee is 6,700 feet below sea level. It's got mountains all the way around it, except it's open on the western side. And, and when the wind would come through that, if the wind would pick up, if a storm would come up on the lake, it would be like a wind tunnel. And, and even on this small sea, about eight miles across is all it was. And, and the disciples had grown up fishermen. They knew how to handle a boat on a, on, a, on a sea this size, on a lake this size. Eight miles across. But it's not unusual when a, a wind kicks up in this kind of wind tunnel on this Sea of Galilee to get 12-foot waves. Five-foot waves are, are common, and they're enough to cause a great deal of problems. But 12-foot waves would be devastating. The disciples got in at 6 p.m. or so. It was eight miles across. And it says here uh, that uh, darkness had set in, but Jesus had not come to them. Then a high wind arose, and the sea began to churn. And after they had rose about three or four miles, they're about halfway. Now, if we go back over to the account in Mark, in, in verse 48, it says, He saw them being battered as they rode because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came towards them walking. Three in the morning. This means these 12 men were in this boat rowing hard to get three miles to four miles across, and they had been rowing for nine hours. Now, uh, these were not slight men. Uh, my son is on a crew team, and he rows, and we got to see him uh, today, Roe, he came in uh, third in his heat. We were so happy for him. He's fairly new to it. And he was working hard. And I was standing there watching my son row and work hard. And he had uh, uh, one of the guys right there next to him telling him to row, row, row. Of course, it's winter here. He was on a rowing machine. But, but they had them all connected. And they were all on a, connected to a board where you could see the little boats to see who was in first, see what place they were in. And I was watching my son work so hard to sprint in, in his race. And I was thinking about these guys rowing hard for nine hours. And Jesus was watching them. Uh, the amazing thing I, I want you to know, by the way, is the disciples were being faithful. He told them to go across the lake. And even though the storm came up, they didn't turn back. They were going to make it. 
and they were rowing and they had been fishermen and they knew how to row a boat and they were working hard and Jesus was on a mountain for whatever reason he could see them just like last week when I talked about the 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 feeding of the 15,000 Jesus early in the day could see there was going to be a need and he was planning to meet the need Jesus could see there was going to be a need because Jesus had sent them across the lake and he knew a storm would come you, you think Jesus is unaware you think he doesn't know he always knows what's coming in Scripture. We don't. We don't see it. But he does, and, and he not only is not surprised by it, but he has the ability to overcome anything. As I said, he's already shown this to them so many times. They have a proof right there at their feet. But clearly, the apostles knew they didn't understand yet. Jesus was teaching, and he was faithful, and he was showing them what they were going to need to understand. That Jesus sent them and they were faithful. But sometimes when we're faithful, life is still hard. Sometimes when you're really trying and, and you're really struggling, it seems like maybe you shouldn't because you're, you're being faithful. You're doing what the Lord has asked. Why is this hard? They were halfway. And then a beautiful thing happened. They saw Jesus walking on the sea. I don't know if they were getting ready to give up. I don't know if they were getting frustrated. I don't know if they were so afraid they were getting ready to just throw in the towel. I don't know how exhausted they were or how close to the end were, but they had made it only halfway through their struggle, and I'm not sure they thought they were going to make it all the way. And they saw Jesus walking on the sea. I, I love this. Because Jesus was walking on the, the wind and the waves were still happening. And Jesus was walking through the wind they were so afraid of. And Jesus was stepping on the waves that, that they didn't want to swamp the boat. The things that they hated most, Jesus was just walking right through. Jesus didn't stop them so he could walk on, a, on flat waters. Jesus came during the storm. It's important to know that. It's important to know that Jesus walks on the things that we're afraid of, the things that scare us the most. He puts underfoot, and he has a handle on. They had been their own boat captains for a while. And they saw Jesus, and it's interesting to me, they weren't looking for Jesus because they were afraid. One of the other accounts is that they thought it was a ghost. But they didn't think Jesus saw them. He, they didn't think Jesus cared about them. They didn't think Jesus had been paying attention to their sweat and their pain and the, the very sinews of their muscles as they pulled against the oars and tried to do what was right and tried to get there. You don't think Jesus was on that mountain praying for them? Jesus has a, a background of praying for them. In John 17, 8, as Jesus is getting close to the cross, he's praying for his uh, disciples. He's saying, Lord, I'm praying for the ones that you gave me, not for the others, but for them, that they will make it. Jesus prays for his people. These are his people. He saw them working. He saw them striving. And now he came to them. But they weren't looking for him. They weren't looking for him in the storm. They were so distracted. They, they were so busy trying to do the work themselves that they forgot. They didn't get the lesson yet. When Jesus, when, when you're one of his, you trust him, you turn to him, you call out for him. They thought he was at distant. They, they thought he was on land. They thought he was uh, gone somewhere else. But how quickly he could walk out to be with them. And he says, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board. And at once the boat was at shore, at the shore where they were heading. How quickly did they get home once they had Jesus on the boat? Because Jesus took care of it. You know, they had been their own captains for a while, and now Jesus was in charge. They could have said, well, he was a son of a carpenter. He, didn't, he doesn't do fishing. He doesn't know boats. What's he doing in charge of it? We're supposed to be the ones to know. But listen, they had been in charge for a long time, but when the Lord comes, let him be in charge. They had to let Jesus be in charge. So I go through all of this, 
but I want to give you four clear points, and I want you to write these down. I want you to tell me if these aren't true. Right from this passage, listen, storms are unpredictable for us. You don't know when they're going to happen. You don't know how bad they're going to be. We had a storm, a snowstorm here in, in central Ohio last night. Yesterday afternoon at 2 or 3 in the afternoon, they said it would be just, just maybe 2 or 3 inches. And, and then it was going to be 4 to 5 inches. I think it turned out being around 7 inches. I, I texted my wife. I, I took my son to swim. He, he swims also, which is good, because if he's rowing and falls out of the boat, he'll need that too. But I took him to a practice, and, and I told my wife, I can see this storm. I grew up in Ohio. This is going to be more than three to four inches. This is going to get bad. And it did. It was unexpected. A surprise. We don't know when storms are going to come up. You, you don't know when you're going to get sick, when you're going to go into the hospital. The nature of storms in our world is unpredictable. People want to control them. People want to know when they're coming. Listen, I've gotten those calls lots of times from folks when it's a, a sudden cancer diagnosis. They were unaware it was coming or a, an auto accident or a heart attack that takes a family member away from a family. Storms are unpredictable. And there have been many times over the years as a pastor, I've been praying for one person. That person recovers and somebody I didn't even know was sick or, or I should have been praying for is suddenly gone home. Storms are unpredictable. But I want you to know, the storm is unpredictable, but Jesus is extremely predictable. Storms are unpredictable for us, but Jesus is extremely predictable. If he knows you, if you've turned to him, if you call him Lord, he's watching for you. He's interceding for you. He is praying for you. And he is making a way for you. And just because you're in a storm doesn't mean that he has stopped being the Lord. That's the second thing. That, that Jesus is the Lord of the storm. Storms are unpredictable for us, but Jesus is the Lord over them. Jesus had sent them into the storm. He knew he could handle the storm. He knew he could walk on the waves. He knew he could calm it at any time. He knew he could take them across at, at the blink of an eye. Because he has that ability. What he wanted them to do was watch for him, call to him, need him. Because isn't that what the apostles were going to teach us? Isn't that what the church is based on? Looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and putting all of our faith in him and trusting in him. And when a sudden storm comes up, knowing that he is still in charge. But how often, when we're surprised, do we take our eye off? Do we forget the blessings? Do we forget the food that he's put at, his feet, at our feet? The blessings he's put at our fingertips. Because storms are unpredictable and unexpected, but Jesus is Lord of the storm. You're either in a storm, by the way, or a storm is coming, or you've just been through a storm. That's the reality of our lives. The disciples were at a point before this, it was before the storm, then they were in the storm, now they're after the storm, and there are going to be more storms in their lives, and they're going to need to learn the lesson to depend on Jesus and trust in his name and call out to him whether you see him or not, whether it's daytime or, or nighttime, whether you're in Samaria or, or in Judea or in Galilee, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what time of day, it doesn't matter how far away you think he is, call to him because he cares for you. And he is Lord of the storm. Well, the thing is, I've already kind of said this, he's, the third thing is he's with you in the storm. He had chosen the time he was going to come to them in the storm. It was his timing, not theirs. They probably wanted him to come in the first two hours or, or three hours. But nine hours later was the time Jesus came. And listen, I've been in the hospitals. I've been by the beds. I've prayed with people. And they say, when is the Lord going to come? When is he going to make it better? He's going to come in his time and in his way, not in ours. Why is he putting me through this? Because he loves you. And you're going to have the opportunity to depend on him. And I'll tell you what, after all of that time straining and, and pressing, the, the disciples had to know 
that they needed to let Jesus be the captain of the boat, that they were relieved of duty once he was there, and he's always there. Don't have Jesus be your co-pilot. If he's in the car, let him drive. He should always be the pilot, the director, the anchor, the focus of your life. He's going to bring you to where he wants to bring you. And he's going to come at his chosen time, not ours. I've had a million people ask me too over the years, when is the Lord coming? At his chosen time. The last thing about storms. They're unpredictable. Jesus is the Lord over them. He is with you and he's going to come to you at the appropriate time in the storm. And the final thing is, the storm will eventually end and it will be glorious. The storm will eventually end and it will be glorious. A, a glorious end to the storm. A glorious end to all the trials. A glorious end to all the worries. He said to them, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him. They should have been willing to take him on board from the beginning. But the reality is when you take him on board, then he's your captain. Then he's your Lord. Then he's in charge of everything that happens on the boat. They let the captain come aboard and he took him right to shore. Are you going through something tough? Are you angry at the Lord because it's unexpected and you didn't see it coming, you need to know that the Lord, that Jesus is the Lord of that storm in your life and that he is with you at the right time in the right way and he's going to bring it to a glorious end at, at the right time that only he knows. Just let him in. Let him be captain. Let him be in charge. I, I want to close on a passage in Revelation 21. I'm going to read down to about verse 7 from Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I don't know the day or the hour of his coming, but I know there, there are going to be some tough things. We're going to go through some tough times. We've got to hold on and be faithful during the storm, and that doesn't mean we stop looking for Jesus. He's the Lord. He's with you. And there's going to be a glorious ending. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. And he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no more, because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life, the victor. I will in, or the victor will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Is that the future you want? A glorious ending to all the struggles, to all the pains, and everything placed right. When will this happen? You say, I, I, I don't know. Because I know that storms in our lives are unpredictable. And I know that Jesus is Lord of those storms. And I know if you trust in him and you watch for him, that he is with you and he loves you. And I know if you let him into your boat and you let him be in charge of your life, he will bring things to a glorious end. Don't send him away. Don't forget to look for him in the storm. Don't forget his wonderful abilities and gifts. And understand that even though he's done wonderful things in the past, if something unexpected happens, you might be thrown. Don't be thrown. Remember, he has chosen you. He has directed you. He has sent you someplace, and he is going to be with you at the right time and the right way to get you through. You can trust him. If you haven't trusted him yet in your life, you can trust him today by just turning to him and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Jesus, come into my boat and be the captain. 
If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It's not hard math. It's a humble heart that makes it happen. If you're a believer, maybe you've been thrown for a loop and, and Jesus isn't the captain of your boat right now. Let him be captain of your boat. The disciples need to learn over and over again that Jesus is the Lord in any time and any place and confessing him as Lord is always the right thing to do. Putting him in charge of your boat gets you to where you need to go with him. And believe me, you want to be where he is. You don't want to go in any other direction except where Jesus sends you. And sometimes when Jesus sends you, it's going to be hard. But that only means he'll come at the right way and the right time to get you through. You can depend on him. You can depend on his promises. And you can depend on a future with Jesus. Because all of the storms will come to a glorious end in Christ. Do you have him? You can today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that somebody would say that prayer, that, Lord, Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner. I, I believe in, your, in my heart that you are Lord, and, and I confess with my mouth that you will save me. Lord Jesus, you don't care how, some, how bad somebody thinks they are or how unsavable they are, because you can save anybody. Because you walk on the wind or walk on the waves and in spite of the wind, all of the things that worry us or make us afraid, you go against. Lord Jesus, help somebody today. Help a believer to come home if they're going through a struggle to, to confess to you that they need to be reminded that you're watching them and, and that you care and that you will come and, and you will take care of things in the right way in the right time. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that John, as an old man, Remember the goodness and the care of Jesus getting into the boat and taking them where they needed to be. Lord Jesus, will you get into our boats today? Take us where we need to be for your glory and not our own. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, for teaching us, not teaching us anything new, but the same lessons over and over that the apostles needed that we need today. Thank you, Father, for your word. Help us to be encouraged by it and encouraged by your Son, our Savior, today. In Jesus' name we pray all things. Amen. Well, my friends, that's all I have. I have more. I would give it to you. I hope this passage is inspirational to you. I hope you're encouraged by it. I hope if you're around in the central Ohio area, you'll come out to Journey and join us on a Sunday morning. I would love that. If you're at distance, you can email me, chris at journeyme.org chris at journeyme.org I, I love to pray for you to encourage you uh, we have bibles and pens and notebooks uh, in our church not a bunch of other books because i really want you to study and draw from god's word strength that you will need and help that you will need and most of all uh, to understand salvation that we will need to be the people of god and to be where he is uh, the lord has overcome and i hope uh, you are with him and allow him to overcome and deal with the storms that frighten you and push you down. I want you to have the hope of Christ in your life. Anyway, with all that being said, uh, I, I hope you can come out to Journey. I love to encourage you and get to know you, and I hope to see you soon.